Ephesians 4. Let's get there. All right. So Ephesians 4, uh, starting at verse 1. So Paul says to the churches in Ephesus, he says, Therefore I, the prisoner, uh, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to live worthy of the calling you have received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. <clears throat> now, this, this particular, particular verse here, before we jump in, I just, like this, this particular verse passage here, had, had, about three years ago, had a profound impact on my heart and my life. Had, had a very, very much a profound impact. I really, really began to, to change and shift a lot of, a lot of um, the way I, I, I thought about um, my walk with Jesus, uh, thought about uh, the way I thought about a lot of the way in which I was dealing with and interacting with other Christians, um, and not just those who are in my church, but but those who are in other churches. <clears throat> and um, you see, so often, so often we, when we talk about our relationship with God. And we talk about salvation and all, and all the good things and all the benefits of that. We, we, we talk very much about the vertical aspect of it. Well, how does, how does Jesus change my relationship with God? How does Jesus actually affect the way I interact with Him? What, 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 what has shifted now? What has changed now? Now that my sins are forgiven, now that I've been washed clean, now that I've been reconciled to the Father, how does that, how does that affect me and my relationship vertically with God, and and, <clears throat> and so uh, so often we, we have this very much a vertical focus, which is not a bad focus at all. But but one one of the things we're we're going to look at here, and and one of the things that, that really began to impact me was is that this relationship that has been established between me and God through Jesus Christ through the cross, right? <clears throat> it doesn't just affect this, but it actually affects all of these relationships as well. There, there's a horizontal aspect to, to salvation, to, to, to the effects that salvation has on all of our relationships, all of them. There, there's a, there a horizontal effect. And so this verse, this verse, this, this little passage here began to truly challenge the way I had been dealing with people who weren't part of my particular theological camp, weren't part of my sort of you know, historical church stream, <clears throat> And, and that's some of the reflections that I want to sort of uh, share with you this morning based on, based on the past three years of, of attempting to live out this passage. And so before we get into that, let, let, let's just get into what, what is actually happening here in, in this passage. What, why, is, why is Paul even writing this? <clears throat> Paul, um, just for, for your own Bible reading at home, when, when you're reading any of Paul's letters, understand Paul isn't just writing letters because... They're, they're, they're just a nice thing to write, you know, hey, you know, church in Ephesus, how's your day? Mine's good, you know, how was your holidays? It's good, oh, that's fantastic, you know, I'm so encouraged, love Paul, you know. <clears throat> that's not why he writes the letters. Letters were too expensive, letters were too expensive to write, to send, and to copy and all this stuff, for, for to just contain niceties. Every single one of Paul's letters were written with a purpose. They, they, they were written because an occasion arose where Paul's like, I need to say something. I, I need to write to this church over here. I need to communicate with this church over there. There's something that's going awry that, that, that needs some correction, that needs some tweaking. There's, there's some knowledge that needs to be imparted here. There's, there's a change in thinking that needs to happen in this church. And so what he does is he then writes a letter. And so when we read, say, you know, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, whatever it is we're reading, right, <clears throat> understand that there was a very specific situation at play that occasioned this letter to be written. Now, Unfortunately, unfortunately, the letters don't come with an explanation. Hey, for those of you reading 2,000-something years later who might be picking up this letter, look, here's the situation that was kind of going on. Here's the things I was really kind of hoping, you know, this, this would address. We have to infer it. We have to infer it from the text. All right? That, that's, just, that's just a tidbit to help you read your Bibles better, to read the Word of God better. And so... So here in, in Ephesus, what I believe Paul is actually dealing with is, is, this, 
is this thing that Paul often had to deal with in the churches, which was this divide between Jew and Gentile, or Jew, uh, you know, Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. You see, because for a very long time, for a very long time, the Jewish people had been the people of God. The people of God. And that's how they viewed themselves, that they had a special covenant relationship with God that the other nations did not enjoy. They, 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 they were exclusively the ones who were in covenant with God, and the other, the other nations had their covenants with their gods and all this sort of stuff, but they alone were in covenant with Yahweh, the Most High God. And so <clears throat> when Jesus comes along, when Jesus comes along and reveals this mystery that, in fact, not only are the Jews inherited, not only are the Jews going to inherit the kingdom, but also the Gentiles have now also been made co-heirs with them, that they're going to inherit it as well, that, 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 that Gentiles are actually going to be brought in to covenant as well. This sparked a lot of questions. This sparked a lot of questions within the Jewish Christian community about, well, what, what does that mean? What, what, so, so, so are all these Gentiles going to convert to Judaism? Are they, are they going to become Jewish? Because, because covenant with God has so, so often has always for us looked like being Jewish? And Paul's answer to that is, well, no. No, 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 no. Something new has happened here. Something fundamentally has shifted here. And this is, this is what he's actually... <clears throat> This is what he, he, he's really writing to about. He, he, he's writing Ephesians to help shape their identity as Christians, not primarily as Jewish Christians or Gentile Christians, but as Christians as a whole, and how those two different cultures now need to interact and work together. You see, so there, 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 was, this, there was this division, not just culturally, but interestingly enough, even in the Jewish temple, there was a dividing wall. There was, a, there was, a, there was a, a, literally a wall that if you were Jewish, you were allowed to come further in, but if you were Gentile, you couldn't pass it. You, 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 you could not come within, within these walls. Um, and, and they took this very seriously. To, to, to give you an example of just how seriously they took this, if you read in the book of Acts and you see Paul, um, Paul there's a particular instance when they actually slam the temple doors shut and they lock Paul inside and they, they're, they're going to lynch him. Oh, they're, like they're almost going to lynch him. And the reason why they're going to lynch him is because they think, they, they've seen him walking around the city with, with Titus, um, who's a Gentile Christian. They've seen him walking around the city with Titus, and they just assumed that he had brought Titus into the temple. And they are so incensed at this thing that it didn't happen, but they, it was, they were so incensed at this that they actually were going to lynch Paul because of this is how serious the Jews took their cultural distinction from the other cultures around them. And now Paul is coming along and he's saying here, he says here in um, Ephesians 2.14, uh, um, he says, For he is our peace who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility. He tore down the dividing wall of hostility. Now, we might just read that and just go, that's a nice metaphor for what's now happened between Jew and Gentile. But there was also literally a wall between Jew and Gentile. And Paul's saying that wall, that, 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 that barrier that always existed between us and them, it no longer exists. <clears throat> so Paul is writing to tell them that this cultural ethnic division that previously existed no longer exists because of Jesus. Those who were far off have now been brought near. Those who were previously excluded are now included. Those who were without hope have now been given hope in Jesus Christ. And so, and so this, this particular passage had a profound impact on my thinking because, you see, Paul says this unity, that this unity is something that you have been called to. As a Christian, you have been called to a unity. If you are in Christ, you are unified or should be unified with all of the other people who are in Christ. There is one body. There is one Lord. There is one baptism. There is one spirit. There is one hope. There is one salvation. Are you getting the point? There's only one. There's only one. We don't get to divide it up. There's only one. And for Paul, this is a very serious issue. Now, the reason why this particular passage had such a, a deep and profound impact on my thinking and and 
and the way that um, and the way that I was interacting with people is because <clears throat> because I wasn't living like that. I wasn't living like that was a reality. Like that was a place that I needed to live out of. I, under, I had to undergo this heart reformation. I had to undergo this heart reformation. I'm not saying that I got saved in, in, in the sense of, of being reconciled to God. But there was, there was a new, or rather I would say a recovered experience of the love of Jesus. And its effect that it was having on my heart. When the Spirit of God begins working in your life, it begins to change everything. And those of you who've walked with the Lord long enough, those of you who've walked with the Lord long enough, you'll know what this is like. You're not the same Christian you were 10 years ago. You're not the same Christian you were 20 years ago. The Spirit brings things to your attention over time and raises issues with you over time. <clears throat> challenges you on preconceptions that you had over time and he changes you and he transforms you he's building you up into the fullness of Jesus's character that's that's what he's doing unfortunately that's a process that's a, unfortunately that's a messy process I wish it was just a flipping of a switch and we could all just be perfectly like Jesus all right some some of you are like that you're far you're far far long far further ahead in that journey um, <clears throat> than me um, but I began to see that my heart had not been obedient to this passage. You see, <clears throat> in, in, in our particular church context and culture, we, we don't, we don't, it doesn't feel like we have as stark cultural, like ethnic divisions, at least within our context. There's some church contexts around the world where it's very clear. Like in some places in the States, in some places in the United States you go, and even though, <clears throat> even though, you know, uh, you know, people would say, you know, uh, white Christians and black Christians are, like, there's no difference between the two. There are largely white churches, and then there are largely black churches. And they have very different cultural styles. That, that, that's a reality. I don't know if we so much have that um, in, in our particular context here in Australia. <clears throat> I wish we were more I wish we were more uh, culturally diverse than what we are. There's a lot of cultures. There's a lot of cultures and a lot of different people groups here in this city that are not sitting here this morning. But we don't tend to, I think, think in these sort of cultural divides as much, as much as perhaps what they were thinking in these days. But there's a whole lot of other divisions. Let, let's, let's not just sort of pat ourselves on the back. There's a whole bunch of other ways in which we like to divvy up the body of Christ. There's a whole bunch of other ways in which we like to divvy up the body of Christ. There's some ethnic divisions. There's cultural divisions. And when I say cultural divisions, like as in what's your style of worship? What, you know, what, what, what theological camp do you fall into? You know, what, what tradition are you going to follow? You know, do you, do you baptize your children? Do you not baptize your children? What what, what are, you know, there's all these sorts of different ways in which we um, not say, well, you're not Christian, but we, we kind of go, you know, it would probably be better if you fellowshiped somewhere else. And now, I understand from a very practical perspective, it makes life a lot easier. It makes life a lot easier for us to kind of just go, you know what? I love you, and I believe you're a Christian, but if you could just worship somewhere else, and I can worship over here, and if we just don't look at each other, we might just both make it to heaven. Yeah. <laughs> I understand from a practical perspective, divisions help stop fighting. Is that really, though, is that really the unity that Paul's talking about here. <clears throat> was he really advocating for, well, that you can have Jewish church and then you can have Gentile church and it's going to be okay. Sort it out. Like, is it, it's going to be fine. What I realize is that in my heart, I had not yet begun 
to truly live out of this place of striving, striving to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. I couldn't genuinely say that I've made every effort. I genuinely couldn't say I'd made every effort to strive for unity with my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I began to think, what would it look like? What would it look like for me to actually live out of that place? For for, for me me to, to, to actually strive for that unity and 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 i guess within me i, I developed a a principle a, a principle that, that helped me to kind of just help shape my thinking on this and and the principle that that i, I developed and, and i'm not saying this is particularly new um someone else may have come up with it first but but this simple line really helped me it's like if i can't find a reason to put you outside of the kingdom and i mean a genuinely good reason like, you say to me, I don't believe in Jesus. Okay, you're outside the kingdom. All right? you're, you're not a Christian. We can all acknowledge that fact. That's okay. I can still love you, right? But we can just acknowledge that you're not a Christian. But, but for everyone who claims the name Christian, for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, everyone who says Jesus is my Savior, I believe in His death, burial, and resurrection, I believe in the forgiveness of sins, and I believe I'm reconciled to God through Jesus Christ alone. For all of those people, if I cannot find a genuinely good reason to put you outside the faith, to put you outside the kingdom, I must, I must, I must strive and make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And what does that look like? Well, it does it mean that I just it does that mean I, I don't stand here from a pulpit and 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 slander other denominations or talk down about their particular views of certain things? Is that, is that all that means? Does it mean does it does it does it mean that you know I, I don't do that privately anymore? Or does it mean I take the positive action, the positive step of actually celebrating, celebrating the goodness, the, the very amazing things that are happening in all sorts of different parts of the body of Christ this day? Does it, does it mean that I look for every opportunity to find common ground, to find ways to be at peace, to find ways of, of being unified with other believers across all the different spectrums of of theological beliefs across all the different spectrums of Christian practice that we experience in the church today. <clears throat> Paul is, is calling these disparate groups together. And even though we might not have that very clear Jew Gentile divide today in our culture, he's calling all of our different walls that we've put up, all our little dividing lines and our boundaries that we've put up. He's calling all of us together in unity. And it has become, you know, you know different people have different things that they're, they're, they're particularly passionate about. And, and I, would, I, would, I would never say, <laughs> it's funny, Tina's asked me the other day, he's like, you know, what are you really passionate about? I'm like, oh, I'm not the guy to kind of put labels like passionate on anything I feel. Um, it's just not me. Like some people are very passionate about a lot of things. I, I, there's things I like. There's things I would like to see. But I'm far more analytical about things and also stuff. But, but the, if, if I could see one thing happen. If there's one thing that could, could happen in and through my life. And, and the ministry that God has for me. I would love. I would love to see all the disparate streams of Christianity flowing as one river. To, to, to actively work between the different groups, to find ways for, for us to actually worship together, to pray together, to, to actually be together, and, and not just at an interchurch prayer event, or a prayer and worship event, where we're like, we'll get together and we'll sing some songs together and we'll pray together, but we're not going to talk about anything else. Like as in, you know, you know we'll, we'll go our separate ways after that, <laughs> and everything will be all right. No, no, what would it be like, what would it be like for you to be comfortable in every church you go to? No matter what their denominational affiliation or, or you know, what, what would that look like? I, 
That is one thing that I would love to see happen in the church. Is not to say that truth doesn't matter, not to say that theology doesn't matter, because those things are important and they matter. <clears throat> but I would love to see a greater level of genuine unity and striving for unity and peace between different groups of Christians, being willing to work with one another, being willing to celebrate, being willing to celebrate one another. <clears throat> Paul says, Paul says here, he says, he's urging them to live worthy of the calling that they have received. And he says that this, the way this is going to happen is, is like this. He says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Now, that's some very important descriptors there. Firstly, firstly, if this is ever going to happen, if, if, if unity is ever going to be brought in the church, not only here at a local level, like in just here in Grace House, that's, more, that's difficult enough. All right? I understand all of you are perfect, but I'm not, and so I make it difficult for everybody else. All right? And so you're going to need humility <laughs> when you're dealing with me. <laughs> and you're going to need patience and graciousness when you're dealing with me. Um, but this is what Paul says. He, says. he says, live worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness. When, when you engage with somebody who disagrees with you, do you do it in humility? And I don't mean you just don't like raise your tone, but like as in, are, are you genuinely trying to actually see things from their perspective, to understand, to truly understand why they've arrived at the conclusions that they've arrived at? Well, what experience have they had? What, what not, just, not just theologically, not just like how have they read this passage, you know, like what's their systematic framework that they're working from, but, but why, why have certain... Um, why have certain people arrived at certain conclusions about certain ethical issues? Why, have, why, have, why do certain groups tend to... Just, I'm just trying to think of a good example. A good, an, a, a good example. <clears throat> can't think of one. That I can, okay, it's not that I can't think of one. It's I can't think of a good one and, and, and a very, it's like threading a needle, okay? It's like trying to talk about something while not being disparaging or, or derogatory towards people who hold that belief. But we all approach God. We all approach the Scriptures through the lens of our experience. As much as we want to all believe that we are just simply Bible-believing Christians... We all approach the scriptures with lenses on and experiences, and, and we all approach the world through those particular through those particular lenses. And so for us to actually be unified, it doesn't mean that we have to just simply set aside all of our differences. Paul here isn't arguing, hey Jews, stop being Jewish. Hey Gentiles, stop being Gentiles. He's saying. What it means to actually be in covenant with God extends far beyond simply being Jewish or culturally Jewish. That's not what it means to be in covenant with God anymore. That those sort of cultural boundaries are no longer the thing that you are going to be looking for for those who are in covenant with God, for those who are saved. <clears throat> and so it's just hard for me, hard for me to, 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 to name a modern example and thread that needle without being disparaging. But people, but people are not as irrational as you might think. Um, so with humility, gentleness, this is, there's a lot to be said about being gentle with people, especially ones you disagree with. You ever have a discussion with somebody and you both you very strongly disagree with one another and the more you raise your voices and the more, you know, you, you give hard implications, well, if you believe that, then I don't know if you're a Christian, you know, like, you know, 
Like, you actually make it more difficult for that person to actually see your point of view. Do you realize that? When you, when you insult people and, and you don't actually, you aren't gentle with them, you actually put up their defense mechanisms and you actually make it so that they can't hear you. You may be genuinely trying to help them. You may be genuinely trying to lead them to truth. But if you can't do it with gentleness, more often than not, you're going to turn people away because of their natural defense mechanisms. You are attacking them. There's a lot to be said about gentleness and persuasiveness. Patience. Just say that the Lord is very patient with me. He's very patient with you. So with the patience that he has extended to us, let us extend it to others, especially those who are Christians. Bearing with one another in love. <clears throat> this is an interesting one because Paul uses the same language when he's talking about persecution. Where he, where he suffered persecution, he was bearing with it. He says, in that same way that you would gladly accept and bear the punishments and the pains of persecution, that same level of commitment that you have to that, have it with bearing with one another. And sometimes it feels like that. Sometimes it would just be easier to go out and get burned on a stake than it is to bear with Christians. Maybe some of you have never had that experience before. Maybe that seems dramatic. Bearing with Christians is an incredibly painful and difficult experience sometimes. But there is a beauty that comes out of it when you do. There is a beauty that comes out of it when Christians are known by their love for one another and their commitment to loving one another and working towards a place of peace and unity with one another. <clears throat> so why does this matter? You know, why does this really matter? You know, can't we all just, can't we all just sort of keep stumbling along and we'll all get to heaven and Jesus will work it out one day? I, I'm going to be honest, I've felt like that for years, you know, that, that, you know, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. It's uncomfortable. It's messy. People are going to say mean things. People are going to be hurtful. There's going to be some people who just aren't going to want to be unified. Or the only way that they're going to be, want to be unified is if you just abandon all of your convictions and agree with them. Why does any of this matter? Well, Paul goes on. <clears throat> he says in Ephesians 4, 7, he says, Now grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. And then he goes on to say in verse 11, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, to build up the body of Christ, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Then we will no longer be little children, tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness in the techniques of deceit, but speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. From him, the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building itself up in love by the proper working of each individual part. <clears throat> the reason why this is necessary and why this is a, a reality that needs to be lived out within our lifetime, within our context, why this is so important is because you matter. You matter to the body of Christ. <clears throat> the particular gifts and abilities that God has placed in you the particular person that he has made you to be matters to us as a church. You being here, you participating in the community, you giving of yourself to other people, it matters. 
You are an essential part of the body of Christ for the building up, the strengthening, and the edification of the body of Christ. Church is not just something you come along to on a Sunday. You are part of something. You have become part of the body of Christ and you absolutely matter. It's not just me. I get to stand up here with the microphone a lot of times and so people often mistake that as being the more important role because, because I get to stand up and I, you know, people get to see my face and, and, and I'm perhaps more prominent here than some other people. But that's just not true. Nowhere in the scripture does it say the one who's holding the microphone is more important than the one who isn't. The greatest among you will be your servant. You matter. The very things that God has placed in you, the very person he has made you to be, matters to the body of Christ. For the building up of everybody else, we need you. We need you. We need you as every part. The proper working of each individual part. We need you. And, and so that's just here in this local local iteration this small iteration of the body of Christ here. But why this, is, why this is important is because the church is not just spoken about as Grace House or, or, or the church down the road. That's not the church. Grace House is not the church. We are the church. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if He is your Savior, if He is your Lord, if you are being discipled by Him, you are part of His body and you are part of the church. And so that extends beyond these walls. That extends beyond our particular iteration here. And it extends to every single other believer who is in the body of Christ, in the city of Logan, in the state of Queensland, in Australia, and in every other place in the world. We are all part of the same body and we need each other. Now, the reason why this is so important that I believe we need to actually work towards building these bridges between all these different disparate groups, right, is because we need, we need each other. I need my Lutheran brothers and sisters. I need them to build me up and they need me to build them up. I need my Pentecostal brothers and sisters to be built up. I need my Methodist, Uniting Church, Anglican, Baptist, Reformed Baptist, Brethren, uh, Brethren Church, Presbyterians, and every other sect and ilk in between. If you are in Christ, you are necessary for the building up of the body. Not just along theological lines or denominational lines, cultural practice lines. We need people who, who do church differently. We need worshipers who worship differently. If you're somebody who likes to dance in worship, we need you. It's a beautiful expression. You may not feel comfortable you know, with me at the front with my hands like this. You know, This is how expressive I get sometimes like that, right? That's me. That's me. But if you're someone who's more expressive physically, please feel free to dance. Find a space and feel free to dance. Dancing is allowed in this church. All right? Sorry, Tance, I probably should have discussed that with you before. I... <laughs> dancing is allowed in the church. Tance is like, no dancing. <laughs> Dancing is allowed in this church. Look, honestly, even, even, more, even more expressive, like, like okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw one out there that may be uncomfortable for some of you, um, but at this point, I've already accepted dancing, so why not? Um, <clears throat> flag worship. Have any of you guys seen this? Yeah? Did they ever make you uncomfortable the first time you saw it? <laughs> I, I, it did me. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. You know, here I am judging. You know, here I am judging over here. Thanks, Bryn. Um, but I used to be very uncomfortable with it. And, and, but there was this one time, there was this one time, I was at this conference, and <clears throat> just in between the sessions, I think everyone going out to lunch, and, and um, I was just kind of sitting alone. 
um, you know, just in between the sessions, and they just had some worship music going on in the auditorium, and there was this lady down the front, just by herself, you know, like nobody else kind of around. She was just down the front, and she had gotten these flags out, like these ribbon flag things, and she started dancing and And I remember, I, remember, I remember it so clearly because I even messaged my wife. I was like, there's someone here flag worshiping. Can you believe it? But then I was watching her. I was watching her worship. And I realized like she had just this expression of pure joy on her face. Pure joy on her face. And in that moment, it was like all of a sudden, I was like, huh. I think she's really worshiping God. It was the darndest thing. And it was in that moment I realized, you know, when they welcomed a returning king back to his city, they used to lead the king with a procession. Dancers, musicians, people with waving flags. And I saw in that moment that she wasn't just doing something weird. She was actually welcoming the presence of the king. I need people like that around me. People like that help you to enter into a greater expression of worship. We, we, we had, we had a, a couple people come to the 21 Days of Worship at the start of the year. <clears throat> and, um, and they asked if they could, if they, they asked if um, it would be okay if they, they brought some, some flags and actually worship with them while they're here. And we said, yeah, that's, that's fine. And I just say, it was, it, was just, it was just so beautiful what they actually brought to the atmosphere and what they actually brought to the service. To be able to actually just watch them worship in that way. You know, you probably don't get the same experience watching me worship. But there are some people, there are some people who worship in such a way through the expression of their bodies, through dance, through, through flag, whatever it is, they have this ability to draw you into God's presence, to have a greater realization of, of who God is. Somehow, it have the spirit moves and, and it's just... This phenomenal thing. So why does this matter? Why does unity in the church matter? Well, because you see, if I had only ever been in my bubble and refused to get outside of my bubble, and we all have a church bubble where we're comfortable, then I would never have been able to experience that. We need each other. We need each other. From him, the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. <clears throat> you are all the individual parts. None of us gets to say to any of the other parts, we don't need you. The eye doesn't get to say to the hand, because you're not an eye, you don't belong in the body. We need you. We need every single one of your gifts and abilities. And not just because of what you can do for the church, but because of who you are. What you bring to the table. Your personality. Your smile. Some people just have an infectious smile that the church needs. I need infectious smiles around me. Some of you are like, mm-hmm. Wish you to get infected with that more. <laughs> but we need you. We need all of you. Not just the people here. We need the people in the church down the road. We need people in church across the city, people in Melbourne, people all around the world. We need them all because the body doesn't just exist here. 
in our little bubble. The body of Christ is global. And in Jesus, he's torn down all the dividing, wall, all the dividing walls of hostility that existed between us. And he's made the two people one. And he's making us one. And it's going to be a very awkward family dinner there at the marriage supper of the Lamb. You're going to be forced to sit across the table looking at people going, I didn't think you were going to be here. And they're looking at you going, same. So from a very practical perspective, let's make that dinner <laughs> let's make the marriage of our lamb a more enjoyable experience for everybody. And let's just learn to get along today. <laughs> Look, I'm going to invite the team up. I'm going to pray. And, um, yeah, I, I would just encourage you to let, let the Spirit speak to your heart. <clears throat> learn to love not only the people who are in this room, but to genuinely love those who perhaps you fervently disagree with and who fervently disagree with you on a great number of things. The Lord will teach you how to love better if you let him. I remember hearing a preacher say one time, your enemies, your enemies will teach you to love if you let them. Now, for those in the body of Christ, they're not our enemies, they're our brothers and our sisters. And so, let's learn to be loving. Let's learn to be built up. Let's learn to build one another up, to encourage one another. And I just want to encourage you. I genuinely want to encourage each and every single person who's in this room right now. You are valuable and you are significant. And not just, like a, not just a self-esteem builder-upper, okay? But that's how God sees you. You, you, are, you are not the appendix to the body. This thing that's just kind of dangling off. Everyone else is useful except for you. No, you are useful. God has purposes for you in the body of Christ. And it would be my joy to see you step into those see you become the working body part that you were always meant to be. Anyways, I'm going to pray. Lord, I just ask, Holy Spirit, that, that you would actually be at work here in this room, helping to bind our hearts together in love. And, de and in unity. God, where there's distinctions and differences and, and divisions, even, even in our midst, I pray, Holy Spirit, you would be bridging those gaps now and, and helping us, and helping us to strive for one another and with one another for unity. And Lord, I just pray for your church across the world today. pray that you would help us. Oh, help us be built up into you, Jesus. To be shaped by your character. To be like you. Holy Spirit, I pray that you be patient with all our deficiencies. That you patiently move us forward. Move us closer together in Jesus. Help us to bridge those gaps. Help us to lay down our lives for others. And I thank you, Jesus, for your goodness and your grace.